Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless your name, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We glorify you, Lord God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for joining tonight. Are you able to hear me? Am I coming across? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You got to respond when I ask a question. Amen. Good evening, everybody. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I pray that the Lord has blessed you on today, that you're having a wonderful day in the presence of the Lord. And that God is good. He protected you. He shielded you throughout the day, kept you from danger, seen unseen. Thank you for joining Otis. God bless you, sir. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're going to go ahead and open up in the word of prayer. I was trying to fool around with this YouTube. I'm not sure if it's coming across live or not, but I'm trying to figure out how to do streaming from YouTube as well as uh, Facebook. Because on the computer, Facebook doesn't operate correctly each week as I've started having difficulty the last few weeks. So I decided to try to do streaming from um, YouTube as well as uh, Facebook. So I pray that this is coming across real clear and, and, and understandable and that technology will work in our favor. Amen. 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 All right. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Again, thank you for tuning in for the Tuesday night Bible study from Redeemed Faith Fellowship Church. I'm the sister pastor Redeemed Faith. I thank God for the opportunity to teach this word again. I don't know about you, but these lessons have been an eye opening to myself. It's been power packed. It's been liberating by the spirit of living God and God is doing an awesome thing through these lessons in our lives. I don't know about you, but as we trust in God's ability to keep us steadfast, unmovable, always the bond of work of the Lord, that God knows that our labor would not be in vain when we put him first. No matter what we go through in this life, keep seeking the face of God, allow him to have dominion and authority. It is a guarantee God will fulfill this promise in your life. Amen. So let's open the word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, I thank you for tonight's lesson. Oh God, I pray that something be said or done that will encourage, edify, build up, and stir us on our faith to trust you all the more. Cleanse our minds from the business of the day that we'll be focused on you to hear a word from the Spirit of the living God. That you will show yourself strong in our behalf on today, oh God, in our weaknesses. We become strong in your strength, oh God, and that and Father, we find ourselves needing healing and deliverance to manifest your power like never before. In the mighty name of Jesus, be glorified, O God, be exalted as we trust in you. For greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And I give you thanks, O God, for the victory in Christ Jesus, for you are great, O God. There's no one like you in all the earth. Have your God-like way in us tonight, O God, as we walk by faith and not by sight in your word. And I thank you, O God, for those who tune in tonight. There's something be said to help change, empower, and strengthen them to live a more fruitful and a freer life in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to read a passage from this book. Um, Lord, help me break this habit. Lord, help me break this habit. This is backwards, but it should show up. Lord, help me break this habit. And it's, uh, it says, accusations breathe doubt. Accusations breathe doubt. Last week we were talking about um, being born 
a son or a child of God versus being born in the natural, how the two are distinguished against, you know, in comparison to one another. They are distinguished apart, but they are also in comparison to one another. One is technon. Technon is born like a natural birth, born into a family, and, and yet you doesn't exemplify or have any character traits of your mother or father until you start developing and maturing in your growth. And then Julios, Julios is another word with me, born a, as a son in the spirit of God, which I, which is a mature child. You have the Tech Nine, which is an immature child. You have the Huios, which is a mature child of God, who was born by the spirit living God and exemplifies the character and the nature of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want you to understand tonight that it's very important as a child of God that you mimic, you, you mimic the characteristics of Jesus Christ by walking in the truth of God's word, allow the spirit of God to minister to you, to keep you in the, in the, in the spirit of truth. When you get a revelation, understanding of your true identity in Christ Jesus, for he is great, sovereign, and holy. And when you walk in the promise of God's word, God himself will begin to manifest his power in your everyday living as you stand fast in liberty Christ has made you free. So tonight I pray that something will be done that will help help you grow in your nature and your characteristics of who Christ is to you, that you stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free. So I want to read um, accusations. We talked about last week about how the people in the body of Christ still babies. Some are, are still lacking mature spiritual growth. They're still... Uh, Design the, the uh, milk of the word and not the meat of the word. And God wants us to grow. He wants us to advance in the kingdom. But you cannot advance in the kingdom of God until you get a revelation who God is to you and the life that we have and, and the identity and the nature we have, which comes from Christ Jesus. Because when Christ is living in your heart, he provokes you to maturity. He provokes you to deny yourself every day and live in the spirit of truth and righteousness. And it's very important that we recognize the weaknesses in our lives. We recognize the the, the, uh, the error in our life that needs to be changed. The errors of our life that need to be cleansed. The errors of our life that need to be purified by the spirit of living God. And allow the spirit of God to do what he promised. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2 it says, And newborn babes desire and the milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So what he talks about, verse 1 says, Wherefore, lay aside all malice, all guile, and all and hypocrisy, and envies, and all evil speaking. Why? Because these are the characteristics of the immature child that's born. But when you're born in the spirit and the characteristics of Christ Jesus, he said, as newborn babes desire the sense of milk of the word. So when you first come to Christ, it's okay to desire the milk of the word. But once you begin to mature, you need to have, have an advancement in your appetite. Your appetite needs to desire more than just milk. Now you get to a place where you eat a little bit of substance or something solid, solid foods in the spirit that can cause your body to mature and grow. Then you grow to the advancement of the meat of the word. We want to desire the meat of the word because now you're in a mature stage of, of growth where you want to be more and more like Christ in your everyday living. So we talked about that on last week about self, uh, self achievement, self achievement. So you got to have some self discipline. And one thing about self discipline is going to make you have the mindset of choosing the right choices on how to live for Christ Jesus apart from criticism, complaining, worrying, pride, envy, anger, gossip, failure to forgive, self-reliance, failure to, to care for our bodies, neglecting our families, indulging in harmful habits. These are the things that the enemy wants to keep you bound to where you never grow in the kingdom of God. And God is saying tonight it's time to advance in the kingdom, time to advance in the kingdom, it's time to grow. Time to grow in the word. So I want to read um, accusations breed doubt. And when you know about doubt, doubt is defined truth. So anything that's, that operates in doubt is defined truth. And that's what anyone wants you to do, defy the truth of God's word. So here's a story from the book, Lord Help Me Break This Habit. So Doreen and her friends, most of them were young believers in their 20s, often met in their homes for worship and fellowship. One even during one of their meetings, Doreen lay on the floor prostrating her, herself in God's holy presence. 
It was powerful time of worship for her. And it says a pastor from Europe and her own pastor were, were there also. The next day, Doreen's pastor asked if he could talk with her. When he came by, he told her the visiting pastor had sensed that she was a lesbian. Her pastor asked if it was if it was true. No, absolutely not, Doreen insisted. There is no inclination in me in that direction. It is simply not true. Because her pastor was spiritual, was the spiritual authority over her, his words wounded her deeply. Pay attention now. When you allow accusations to come from anybody to tell you something negative about another person, it can harm that person deeply in their heart. Yet he offered, yet he offered no apologies, no prayer, and no opportunity for counseling. And when gossip began spreading that she had lesbian inclinations, her pastor did nothing to stop the rumor. That's a shame because we as spiritual leaders need not to be so quick to take a message from other people to tear down anybody in the body of Christ. We need to be discerning of the spirit and know if this statement someone brings to you is true or not, you need to consult God, not other people. And because this room began to spread, the pastor didn't even apologize. He had no sympathy, no sympathy for her. Didn't even care, pretty much. For several years, Doreen continued to suppress her deep emotional pain because of the accusations. The power of suggestion was at work in her mind. Does anyone else see me like this? She wondered while trying to, to do everything she could to prevent a lie from com coming up against her. She chose more feminine clothes, wore earrings, heels, and high, bright colors, and anything to keep her from looking masculine. So because this was in her heart, the wound had scarred her. She felt like, is anybody else thinking this way about me? So everywhere I go, is people looking at me differently because they think I'm a lesbian? Due to a job transfer, she relocated to another city and found a new church home. Still plaguing doubt sometimes surfaced, and Doreen questioned, does God accept me as I am? How many times there have been rumors or accusations brought against you, and you question God, God, do you really care about me? Do you really love me? Are you here for me? Do you know what's going on in my life? And how people are talking about me behind my back. They're backstabbing me. They're hating on me. They're persecuting me behind my back. Do you care? And these are the questions that I'm sure aroused in her mind. She continued pushing such thoughts down into the dark recesses of her soul. But finally, almost 20 years after she had been falsely accused, she went through a Christian counseling program. Sometimes you can't fix your own issue. Sometimes you can't overcome your own problem. You have to seek spiritual counseling. And the, counsel, the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So I can find security being able to go to a spiritual counseling session and to lay my weight down at this counselor where they can give me godly sound wisdom and instructions on how to deal with the wounds that scarred me so deep. And in the process, I can allow God's presence to heal my brokenness. Her, her counselor helped Doreen see the words spoken against her had robbed her of many things. Check this out. She had isolated herself from others, feared to get close to someone again, would again bring false accusations. So because of this, this wound that was so deep in her heart, she set herself apart from other people when she isolated herself and didn't want to be around anybody else, afraid that the same rumor was began to pop up again. The false rumor that the, that the pastor, that her pastor did nothing to stop had caused her even to question God's love for her. Because the pastor didn't deal with the situation in the godly manner, it caused the question of our relation with God. Doreen found freedom through renewing her mind with the scriptures and memorizing verses in the Bible about who she was, who she is as a child of God. Today she is fulfilling, she is, has, today she has a fulfilling position 
in the company she worked for since college, and she she owns a beautiful home. In her spare time, she operates a website for Christian ministry and finds great satisfaction in volunteering her skills. Now at last, she is very sure the love the Lord has for her and how he accepts her as she is. So the moral of this story is don't allow other people to dictate to you who you are. When you know that God has delivered you from a certain type of lifestyle, a certain behavior pattern of life, a stronghold and addiction, you don't let other people hold you as a victim to the things of the past. Because if Jesus says, you know, if we lift him up, he'll be lifted up. If he be lifted up, he'll draw him into himself. So he said he'd be lifted up. Guess what? He took your judgment. He took the accusations. He took the rumors when he was lifted up on the cross in order to bring you redemption that you can come to God and receive forgiveness because he who the Son is set free is free indeed. So you got to know for your own self-satisfaction and gratification the love of God that he has for you. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourself with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So if Christ suffered the rumors, the accusations, the false charges, false allegations against you, that you can be free in your mindset, in your spirit, man, guess what? When you suffer, you can always remind yourself that I cease from sin even in the midst of suffering because Jesus took it upon himself. So the sufferings that I endure in this life does not compare to the glory of God which shall be revealed in me because he loved me and I love him. A person who has ceased from sin is perfectly obedient child of God. Is a perfectly obedient child of God. He is mature. He has chosen God's way and not his own. Just as Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered, we learn obedience by the difficult circumstances we face. We talked about this last week, how when you're going through trials and tests and tribulations and the enemy wants to see if you're going to buckle under pressure, when you remind yourself that the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who died for me on the cross, who suffered in my stead, that now I can receive the right to the tree of life and live in the freedom that's found in knowing him. Glory to God. Anyone have any questions or comments you want to type on here tonight? Feel free to do so. Glory to God. Glory to God. I tell you, God is so awesome. He is so awesome. Praise God. Glory to God. So when you recognize that you're going to suffer in this life, it's not going to move you out of your character because it's part of the maturing and the growing process. If I never suffer, I'll never grow. If I never advance through tribulation, I'll never mature. You know what I just said? If I don't go through difficult times in my life, I will never be who God wants me to be. So it's part of the growing process, the growing pains. Just like a child when they're growing, their life begin to change. Their mind begin to change. Their attitude begin to change. They face difficult and challenges that they never experienced before. But it's all part of the growing process to teach them how to operate in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And in the process, God will begin to advance them in the kingdom. It is so awesome. So awesome. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. Amen. We, now we understand one reason why we have people in the church who have been Christian for more than 20 years who can quote verses and chapters of the Bible and have heard thousands of sermons and read many books, but still wear spiritual diapers. We talked about this last week. People who do not have a passion, a desire to mature, to grow up in the kingdom, are the ones who are still sucking the bottle are the ones who are still wearing spiritual diapers and still carrying around their mess in their diaper 
And God is trying to get you to the place to acknowledge where are you in your spiritual growth, where he can mature you and provoke you to change your life by changing your mentality. I heard something this morning by Tony Evans, Pastor Tony Evans out of Texas, Oak Cliff Bible Church. He said this one statement. He said the mind and the ears work together. He said the mind and the ears work together because whatever I hear through my ears, it goes into my mind. Whatever gets into my mind, either going to call me to advance in the kingdom or degress in the kingdom. It's up to you to make a decision. The life that you live, are you still carrying your diaper mess? Are you still sucking on the bottle? <coughs> or do you feel the spirit? of the Lord tugging at your heart, speaking in your ear gate, it's time to grow up. Grow in grace and in what? The knowledge of who he is. Grace is what keeps you. Grace covers you. Mercy protects you. And God's presence leads and guides you. And the spirit provokes you to have ears to hear where well, you can grow in the kingdom through the knowledge of him. If I don't get knowledge, I don't get understanding. How am I going to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior if I'm never taking the time out to study his word? The more I study his word, the more I advance in the kingdom of God. Amen? Moving on a little further. Self-preservation. Self-preservation. A common excuse for self-preservation through disobedience is offense. Self-preservation. I'm preserving myself for being abused. I'm preserving myself for being offended. I'm preserving myself for being hurt. I've been in a relationship where I was scarred. I was broken. I was torn. I was wounded. I was bruised. I was messed up mentally. So I preserve myself we talked about this in previous lessons, how we build a false wall of security. And that wall is my protective barrier. And if you, I don't let anybody cross that boundary to come across that barrier where I'm protected. Reminds me of the wall of Jericho. When God told Joshua, he gave him instruction that I'm going to give the city into your hand. Because in order to get to the promised land, you got to defeat many different giants, many different armies, many different boundaries in your life to prevent, that's preventing you from getting to your promise. God gave us stern instructions on what he needed to do for seven days. And on the seventh day, he said, send forth the priests, send forth the praises, send forth the warriors. And begin to lift a loud shout. Begin to shout, God has given us the city. Break your vessel against the wall. And the wall came tumbling down. Why? Because they acted upon obedience. They let go of their guard of self-preservation and obeyed the spirit of living God that God would be the protection. And in the process, God led them into victory. Defeat Jericho. You all have, we all have, a Jericho wall. Some walls are bigger than other people's walls. Some thicker than other people's walls. Why? Because we hide behind our self-security with the habits and the addictions, the things we know that's not of God, the things that keep us from growing in grace and knowledge of who he is, that keep us from advancing the kingdom of God. We hide behind our wall. And God is saying tonight, I'm bringing in the wrecking ball, a spiritual wrecking ball, because the word of God is like a wrecking ball. A large metal ball that has the ability and the power to shatter walls. And he said, if you submit to my lordship and my authority, I'm going to break that self-secure wall. I'm going to break that barrier down that's preventing you from advancing in the kingdom to get into your promise that I have for you. There's a false sense of protection in harboring an offense. Because I was offended, I got secured in the offense. So I built myself a security in offense. So because I've been offended, I'm not going to let you hurt me again. You might have a spouse. 
You might have a significant other. You might have a coworker. You might have a boss who keeps on offending you. And you get to the place yourself where your heart becomes callous, come hearted, and you feel pain, and you feel hurt, and you hold on to the offense in your heart and never let go nor forgive anybody for offenses. So check this out. You stack it on, you stack it on, you stack it on, you stack it on. Offense, 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 offense. Until the offense becomes so big, there's no sensitivity left in your heart. There's no compassion. There's no regret, no remorse. Because I built so much offenses from other people hurting me, now I'm shielded and I'm stuck in a dark place. I read something today that said being in a dark place doesn't necessarily mean that you're in a place where you, there's no hope. But it means that God still has the ability and the power to come into your heart to deliver you and to set you free. And the only thing you got to do is trust God in his word and know with confidence that God has the power to use the darkness in your life to plant you. In the process of darkness, in a dark place, sometimes might be the place God strategically planted you in order to plant you in himself to get rid of all the mess and the stuff that's preventing growth. So he put you in a place sometime of solitary where you have no choice but to begin to grow in the things of God. That is so powerful. It keeps you from seeing your own character flaws because blame is deferred. We talked about this last week. I can't see my flaws because I'm blaming everybody else for the reason of my heart. You never have to face your role, your immaturity, or your sin because you only see the faults of the offender. You need to write that down. You never have to face your role, immaturity, or your sin because you only see Faults in other people. And that's what God is saying tonight. If you're being blinded by offense, only thing you see is the people who hurt you never see the thing that you might have done or the thing God trying to perfect in you or the things God trying to pull out of you. You're going to always have other people in your eyesight, your line of sight, who is offensive against you. And that's all you see. Because I'm blinded by offense. And that'll preach right there by itself, being blinded by a fence. Because the many people in the body of Christ sitting in church Sunday after Sunday who've been blinded by a fence because of what people have done to them in church. And so you go from church to church to church looking for a perfect church and never find one because you're blinded by a fence. Therefore, God attempts to develop character in you by this opposition is now abandoned. So what God is trying to use in an offensive situation to perfect you, to build character in you, is being abandoned because your, your blindness has stopped you from seeing what God is doing. The offense or offended person will avoid the source of the offense and eventually flee, becoming a spiritual vagabond. We talked about this previous lessons. Spiritual vagabonds. A person who's a wanderer, a person who has unforgiveness, a person who don't care about nobody else but themselves, a person always begging, always in need, always in want, because you haven't surrendered to Jesus Christ. Recently, a woman told me about a friend who left her ch uh, one church and began to attend another. She invited the new pastor over for dinner, and of course, in the course of a conversation, the pastor asked why she left the first church. The lady told him all about the problems in leadership of her previous church. The pastor listened and attempted to comfort her. From, ex from experience, I know it would have been wise for the pastor to encourage the woman by the word of God to deal with the hurt and the critical attitude. If necessary, he would have suggested that she return to the former church until God released her in peace. When God releases you in peace, you will have, you will not have the pressure to justify your departure. 
You will not be under pressure to judge or critically expose the problems of your previous church. I knew it would only be a matter of time before she would respond to the new pastor in his leadership the same manner she had with the previous ones. When we retain an offense in our hearts, we filter everything through it. When we retain offense in our hearts, we judge everybody else by the same offense. So no matter what church I go to, I'm going to judge everybody the same way I had experienced in the previous church. I was hurt in the previous church. I didn't like the leadership in the previous church. So everywhere I go, I'm going to have the same mindset, the same vagabond spirit, the same negative attitude to judge everybody according to the same way I was offended. And I never find myself being set free. There's an old parable that fits this situation. Back in the days when settlers were moving to the west and wise men stood on a hill of a new western town. As the settlers came from the east, the wise man was the first person they met before coming to, to the settlement. They asked eagerly what people of the town were like. He answered them with a question. What were people like in the town you just left? You, check, you catch that? You catch that what I said? A wise man who came from the west to settle in a certain place he came, and as he came to this place, people came from the east, asked the question, what were, people, what were the settlers like in this, in this town? <clears throat> and his response was, what were people like when you just left? Some said the town we came from was wicked. The people were rude, gossip, who took advantage of the innocent people. It was filled with thieves and liars. The wise man answered, this town is the same one that you just left. They thanked the man for saving them from the trouble they had just come out of. Then they moved on further west. Then another group of settlers arrived and asked the same question. What is this town like? The wise man asked again, what was the town like where you just came from? These responded, it was wonderful. We had dear friends. Everyone looked out of each other's interests, for each other's interests. There was never any lack we called all care for one another. If someone had a big project, the entire community gathered together to help. It was a hard decision to leave, but we felt compelled to make the way for the future generation by going west as pioneers. The, the wise old man said to them exactly what he said to the other group. This town is the same way you just left. You hear the moral of this story? Two different people with different perspectives of the towns they left. One said the town was wicked. The other town, a person said the town was loving. Well, they just love. Caring, pe people care about each other. So it's your perspective on how you're going to perceive your church. So whatever church you go to, if I perceive them as a wicked church, a negative church, then I'm going to receive everybody the same way I perceive the way I just left another place. But if I come to church with an expectation that God's presence in this place, God's love is in this place, people care about one another, it all needs to be met through one another because we love each other enough to make sure everybody's okay. Then I'm in the right place where God has brought me to to cause me to use the gifts and the talents he placed inside of me for the building of his kingdom in this church. So you have to make a decision not based on what other people think but what you think about yourself. What God tells you in your spirit what it's like. And you perceive what God has for you when you let go of your guard, let go of your self-preservation and say, God, I'm here because you sent me here and I give you glory. And I tell you, when you do that, the Spirit of the Lord will show up every single time. These people responded with joy. Let's settle here. How they view their past relations with their scope for the future ones. The way you leave a church or relationship is the way you will enter to your next church or relationship. Jesus said in John chapter 20, verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. We preserve the sins of other people when we pick up an offense and harbor resentment. You are just read. We preserve the sins of other people when we pick up an offense 
and harbor resentment. And that's all I'm going to see is what other people have done to me because that's all I, I, I experienced in the place I was just at. If we leave a church relationship resentful and embittered, we will enter the next church or relationship with the same attitude. It, it would then be easier to leave our next relationship when problems arise. So anytime a problem arises, you quickly abandon the ship. That's what it's saying here. If you can't deal with offense and opposing forces that come against you in this church, then you need to go to the altar and pray and ask God to give you strength and give you a sensitive heart to listen to the voice of the Spirit and do what God tells you to do. We are, we are dealing not only with the hurts that, peep, that took place in a new relationship, but also the hurts from our former relationships. And that, that's something to really take note of. Because if you don't deal with offense from one place you're at, you go to another place, it's like relationships. If I was in a broken relationship and I was hurting this relationship, I'm going to take the same pains, the same hurt, the same brokenness into a new relationship and I'm going to view the, the new person with the same mindset just like taking new wine, putting an old wine skin. I'm going to take the same thing and view the next person with the same negative attitude because I was offended and I was hurt. So we got to recognize that it's the enemy that's at work behind the scene to keep you blinded from walking in obedience and walking in truth and having a repentful heart. It's very important as a child of God, if you got any form of offense in your heart, to ask God to forgive you and go to that person. The word tells us you can't even bring your arm to the altar or your, your offering to the altar and give it to God until you make amends with your brother or your sister. Because if you can't repent for what you've done or what other people have done to you, forgiveness is not for the other person, it's for you to keep you in right standing and right relationship with God. No matter how bad it hurts, no matter how difficult it is to go to somebody to ask for forgiveness something you didn't even do. I tell you the truth. When you walk in obedience, you find yourself having such a freedom and a compassion and a love to fill your heart to know that I've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and I don't have to hold on to any form of offense or any negative foul spirit to try to enter my heart to hold me in captivity. I can walk in freedom and truth every day of my life. My God, my God. Statistics says 60 to 25% of divorced people end up getting divorced again after remarrying. The manner in which the person leaves their first marriage determines the path into the second marriage. Ain't that something? The very thing I just mentioned, you go from one relationship, being offended, you take it to a new relationship. In the same relationship that I was in before, I got the same mindset in the new relationship which caused the new relationship to dissolve, to fall apart. The manner in which a person leaves their first marriage determines the path into their second marriage. The unforgiveness that they hold against their first mate hinders their future for the second one. My God, that's deep. The unforgiveness in the first relationship, it hinders in the new relationship. Because I can't learn to forgive and let go then I take the same pain and I hurt the new person because of my attitude, my mindset has been scarred, been broken, been torn. My heart is messed up. So I got the same mess I'm carrying to a new relationship and bring this relationship down because I'm messy. It might not even be the other person. It's you many times. And God is trying to show us today we need to examine our hearts to see what's in my life that's hindering me from progressing in the kingdom of God. Am I holding this to something that happened to me over 30 years ago? Am I hurting from something a loved one did to me and they passed away and I never asked to forgive me? Or forgive them for what they've done to me? You need to think about it. What is it that's in my heart that's preventing me from moving forward in the assignment, the plan, the purpose God has for my life. In blaming the others, they are blind to their own role 
of faulty characteristics. In blaming others, you are faulty. You're blinded to your own faults and characteristics. To make matters worse, now they have added fear of being hurt. Now I'm blinded from my own mistakes, my own shortcomings and failures, I'm blaming somebody else. Now I add the spirit of fear. Because God is making the spirit of fear, but love, power, and sound mind, right? And the, what, what the word says? If God has given you the spirit of, has not given you the spirit of fear, offense will bring you to a place where you gravitate to the spirit of fear. Offense will bring you to the place where you gravitate to the spirit of fear. So when God is trying to set you free, I'm afraid of change. I'm afraid of letting go. I'm afraid of letting my guard down. I'm afraid of loving. I'm afraid of caring for somebody else. I left a broken relationship, so I'm afraid of getting to a new relationship because I don't want to be hurt again. So the fear paralyzes me from getting to a new relationship that God has ordained and planned for my life. And because of fear, now I'm in bondage, I cannot see myself being set free. The principle is not limited to marriage and divorce. It can apply to all relationships. This principle can be applied to all relationships about fear, about being blinded, about being offended. If I'm not careful, the enemy will paralyze you, stop you from advancing in the kingdom of God and maturing in the areas of your life where there needs to be growth to make you better. A man who had previously worked for another minister came to work for our ministry. He had been hurt by his former leader, but time had passed and I felt the Lord was leading me to ask him to come to work with us. I believe he was in the process of overcoming this hurt. I called his former employer and shared my plans to bring him on staff. He encouraged me and thought it was good to move because it thought it was a good move because he, he knew I cared for both of them. He believed the healing would come to complete while he worked with us. I told the men that my prayer was for restoration and healing in their relationship. So between the, the new man that's coming to the ministry and the former leader, he's praying that God will restore the relationship, heal and deliver. When the man joined our ministry team, there were problems almost immediately. I addressed the issues only to see temporary relief. It seemed he couldn't get beyond his former leadership. It kept coming back to haunt him. He even accused me of doing the same things his previous leader had done. I was troubled because of the well-being of this man was more important to me than it would, than what could do for me as an employer. I made exception for him that would not make any other employer because I desired to see him heal. So he made exceptions. So whatever he's going through, I'm just going to deal with it until we get some resolution. After only two months, he resigned. He felt trapped in the same situation as, as before. He left saying, John, I never worked for another minister again. I blessed him and watched him go. We loved him and his wife. The sad fact is that there is a strong call on his life for the very thing he had left, though the man does not mean so though that man is a though that does not mean he won't have success in, in other areas. I was troubled after he left and I sought the Lord. Why did he leave so quickly when both of us were so right about it? A few weeks later, the Lord used used a, a wise pastor friend of mine to answer this question. He said, many times God will allow people to run from situations he desires for them to face if they are set on running from them in their hearts. Ain't that something? Many times God will let you run for something he wants you to face. But because of fear, you call yourself to run. He then relayed the story to Elijah who ran from Jezebel, 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. Elijah had just executed the evil prophets of Baal and Asherah. They were the men who had left the nation into idolatry and had eaten at Jezebel's table. When Jezebel heard this, she threatened to kill Elijah 
with 20, 24 men. I mean, in 24 hours, correction. She turned to King Elijah in 24 hours. God wanted Elijah to confront her, but instead he ran. He was so discouraged that he prayed to die. He was in no condition to fulfill the assignment. God had sent angels to feed him two cakes, allowing him to run for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. When he arrived, the first thing God asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? This seemed like a strange question. The Lord gave him food for the journey, allowing him to go. I want to ask him when he arrived, what are you doing here? God knew Elijah was set, was set on escaping the difficult situation. So he allowed it, though it was obvious, obvious from his question that it wasn't, wasn't his original plan. So God had a plan for Elijah to run. Then he said, Elijah, go and return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king of Israel. Elijah, the son of Shephat, of, Ab of Abel, Maloah, shall anoint you as the prophet in your place. On Elijah and Jehu's ministry, this wicked queen and her evil sister were destroyed. Second Kings chapter 9 and chapter 10. This assignment was completely, was not completed by Elijah, by the successor God told him to anoint in his place. Isn't that something? If you don't do what God tells you to do, God already has a remnant in the bush who's going to fulfill the plan and call he has for you to do that you won't fulfill. The pastor said, if you are so set, so if we are so set in our hearts not to, to face difficult situations, God will actually release us even though it is not his perfect will. Isn't that something? But even though it's not God's perfect will for you to run from situations, if God knows you can't handle it, you can't face it yourself, he will raise up a successor, someone who will fulfill it for you. I literally remember an incident in, in Numbers 22 that illustrates the same point. Balaam wanted to curse Israel because they were, uh, they were great rewards. There were great rewards in it for him personally. He asked the Lord the first time if he could go, if he should go, and God showed him that he will, will, uh, excuse me. And God showed him that his will for Balaam was not to go. When the prince of the Moab returned with the money and honor, Balaam went unto God again. It is ridiculous to think God would, God's mind would, would now change because of money and honor we were in it for, for Balaam. But this time God said, go with them. Now why did God change his mind? The answer is that God did not change his mind. Ben was so set on going that God let him go. Ain't that something? So you want something so bad, you want a person in your life so bad, and God says, it's not my will, that person's not for you. God says, okay, fine, get him. You want a job so bad that God says, that's not for you, but you want it anyway, God says, go. Why? Because God don't change his mind about his will for your life. We change our mind because we allow our hearts to have a strong passion for something God don't want us to have. And in the process, we make more painful decisions and we cause us to be hurt when that was not God's plan for your life in the first place. We can pester the Lord regarding something for which he had already shown us in his will. He would then allow us to do what we want, even when it's against his original plan. God will let you do something against his plan because you want it so bad. Often God's plan causes us to face hurts and attitudes we don't want to face. Often God's plan causes us to face hurts and attitudes we don't want to face. Yet we run from the very thing that will bring strength to our lives. We run from the very things that will produce strength in our lives. Refusing temporary relief, the root of the problem remains untouched. If I refuse to face oppositions and the challenges in my life, the root problem is still there. The underlying issue is still there. Just like a person with cancer, the underlying issue might be a tumor. It might be a disease in your body that's producing cancer in your bloodstream. If you don't get to the root cause to find out what the source is, it festers and begins to spread throughout the whole body for, the, for you know the whole body becomes cancerous. Why? Because that's how sin operates. Sin is the same way. If I don't get to the root cause of a habit or addiction to find out why am I so driven with a passion for the thing that God don't want me to love. If God has placed something in your life to change your life 
and you know it's for your benefit and you run from it, Satan takes you further and further from the plan and the will God has for you and he keeps you longer than you intended on staying until you get to the place where you recognize, I can't fix this, I can't change this, I need God in my life. Refusing to deal with offense would not leave us free of the problems. Refusing to deal with offense will not leave you free of the problems. It only gives us temporary relief. I can get temporary release from issues in my life, but never dealt with the root problem. So I can cover up, I can masquerade and say that I've been delivered from alcoholism and drug addiction, homosexuality, fornication, adultery, from lying and stealing, murder, and all the things God told us not to do, but I still have the root. So I can cut off the surface, like dandelions in your yard. You cut the surface off with the lawnmower to cut down the dandelions. You don't realize you just spread the seeds everywhere else. So before you know it, now the dandelions have become productive. And they're spreading your whole yard. Why? Because you didn't deal with the root. You got to buy some Roundup. <coughs> Excuse me. Treat your yard with Roundup. Because Roundup has a way of working its way down in the soil to get to the root and kill it from the root up. That's how God operates in the spirit. He looks at your situation. He looks at your problems. He looks at your issues. And he deals with it from the root up. And he causes you to find liberty and freedom in his presence by allowing the Holy Spirit to get into the root and dig up the root cause of the sin in your life to where he can bring a relief, not temporary satisfaction, but an eternal satisfaction that's found in knowing him. My God, my God. It is impossible to establish a healthy relationship with a person who has left another relationship bitter and offended. It is impossible to have a healthy relationship with someone who left another place of ministry offended and hurt. You got to allow God to deal with that spirit of the enemy. It's a flea flying around here bugging me. But you got to allow the spirit of God to deal with the enemy, root cause, which caused you to be bitter and offended and allow him to heal your brokenness and lead you to a place of forgiveness. The word tells us love forgets wrong so that there is hope for the future. Love forgets wrong so there's hope for the future. If we have truly overcome an offense we earnestly seek to make peace. The time may not be right immediately, but in our hearts, we will watch for the opportunity for restoration. In other words, some things take longer to be healed from than other things in your life. But God has the power, he has the ability to bring you through it and bring you out of many issues in your life only when you trust in him. A wise friend later said, there's an old proverb which states, once a dog has been scalded with boiling water, he would, he would even fear cold water. Once a dog has been scalded with boiling water, he will even be fear of cold water. How many today are afraid of the cold water that brings refreshing because they have been burned once and cannot forgive? Ain't that something? How many times have you been scarred? Been scoiled? With a heated situation? And you find it difficult to forgive? <clears throat> if you love God, whosoever loves God is born of God and knows God. If you've been born again by the Spirit of the living God, you're going to allow the Spirit of God to bring healing in your life. To bring deliverance <clears throat> in your mind. Because God has the power, He has the ability of setting you free. Only if you want it. Jesus desires to heal our wounds. But we are often, we do not let Him heal them because it's easier road to take. 
<clears throat> excuse me, holding on to a fence is the path of humility and self-denial that leads to healing and spiritual maturity. It's the path of self-denial and heal it leads to healing and spiritual maturity. <clears throat> and decision is up to you to make that choice. It's a decision to make another well-being more important than your own, even when that person has brought great sorrow. You still need to pray for those who hurt you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know what's going in my throat. Pray that God delivers. Pray that God sets them free. Pray that God heals them. Because if you pray for those who persecute you and be huge, you say, I'm not evil against you falsely for my name's sake. For so persecuted, the promise will be for you. So you got to bless your enemy. Pride cannot, cannot travel this path. But only those who desire peace at the risk of rejection. Even in the midst of rejection, you can have peace. It is, it is a trail that leads to humility and abasement. It's a road that leads to life. So you're only going to find true satisfaction in life resting in the finished work of the cross in the presence of the Lord. When you humble yourself, Jesus said, if any man desire to come out to me, let him first deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. So I want to encourage you tonight. If you're one of those that this lesson you can identify with self-preservation. And you find yourself holding onto a fence, unforgiveness, bitterness, stuck in a dark place. I encourage you tonight to let go and let God come in and heal your brokenness and bind your wounds. And I guarantee he will do just that. So Lord God, tonight I thank you for this lesson. I pray that something has been said or done to God that will encourage, edify, and build your people up in faith. Trust you, O oh God, to lead them in victory. Forgive for our sins of unforgiveness, the sins of hurt, sins of pain that we held on to for so many years. And cleanse our minds and our hearts that we receive healing and deliverance and be led in victory by faith to walk in your promises of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I pray that you be encouraged tonight and know that God loves you and so do I. And if you hold on to a fence, let God come into your heart tonight and strengthen and encourage you to walk in the liberty of Christ has made you free. You may not know Jesus, your Lord and Savior. You might even be a backslider tonight. I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins. Knowing unknowingly, cleanse my mind and my heart, O God, from all unrighteousness. Sanctify me by thy truth, for thy word is truth. And come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner has turned their life over to the Lord. So the Lord says the same. We'll resume again next week, Tuesday, 6 o'clock hour. I should be streaming live from Redeemed Faith Church, where we have been doing every other Tuesday. If you're in the Milwaukee area, feel free to join us at Redeemed Faith 3223 West Lloyd Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I guarantee we have a great time studying the Word of God. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to inbox me those questions. And I guarantee we'll answer the question accordingly by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit. You all have a good night and stay excited. And may the Lord watch between me and thee while we absent one from another until we meet again in Jesus' name. God bless you. Shalom. Peace be unto you.